You asked for it, here it is. How to set up your own role-playing club. Hello everybody, my name is Guy and you are watching How to Be a Great GM! And we are going to learn how to be great GM club managers! Uh, who knows, maybe it's too much caffeine, maybe it's chocolate, I, whatever! I'm in a good mood, I hope you're in a good mood, and we're talking about setting up a role-playing club. Now, a club is different from setting up a role-playing group. A group is just one set of game that will happen, whereas a club is hoping to attract multiple different games that will run at the same time in the same venue, usually on the same night. So a lot of folks have said, hey, how would I go about setting up my club? Well, firstly, and most importantly, you need to know that there is some kind of interest. How do you do this? Well, head along to your local gaming store, and if they don't already have gaming facilities available, have a chat with them to see maybe they have an overflow, they have too many people wanting to play games, or they're just not interested in running it themselves. That's an opportunity for you to step in and say, well, hey, I want to form a club. Alternatively, if you are at college or at school or wherever you happen to have a group of people, even at work, I know I certainly have had several of my work colleagues say, hey, you do that role playing stuff, right? How do we do that? How can we set up a, how can we, what can we do? I don't have time to run a game for them, but I certainly could help them set up a club and attract a lot of people to play. First and foremost, rule number one or step number one or guide number one, point number one, the first thing that you should find find is a venue. And the venue needs to be safe and it needs to be with an easy access of public transport. So those are the two major things. And then obviously big enough for you to support at least three or four tables. There's no point in setting up a role-playing club in your own backyard if you can only fit one table comfortably. On a side note, you also want to try and find a venue that doesn't have a lot of echo, 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 echo. Because, because that means that when people are talking, 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 their sound is going to travel all over the place, 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 place. So those are some things to bear in mind. Number two, you want to have relatively isolated spaces for your gaming tables. So it doesn't have to be separate rooms. That would be ideal. And certainly from my experiences in Tokyo, what a lot of people used to do was go and hire a karaoke booth for the evening. And then there would be five karaoke booths of people screaming their lungs out. And then there would be one karaoke booth of Dungeons and Dragons. Nonetheless, no one could hear you. Everyone could have a a good time playing, but the karaoke booth tables were not set up for role players. They were set up for drinks and snacks and all those good and wonderful things that go along with singing karaoke when you're living in Tokyo. Uh, they didn't have tables for role playing. So that was a bit of a, a downer. The point is you need to make sure that the space that you've now secured has room enough for people to comfortably sit around and have their rather energetic conversations about how they're playing their game. If you can find spaces that maybe have dampening on the walls or which have slightly smaller but separate rooms, that would be ideal. Number three is a little bit of a hard pill to swallow, but I feel that I must address it. Expect half the number of people that you're hoping to attract. It will take time for your club to grow as word of mouth says, hey, come and join us for a game, etc., etc." Or as your advertising and marketing study takes time to, well, bring it to the fore of people's attention. So expect half the number of people, but cater for the full amount because you never know. You need to have, and this is step number four, by the way, or idea number four, you need to have a code of conduct. Not something just sitting in your head where you go, oh yeah, we've got some rules, don't be, don't be a dick, just be nice. No, 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 no. It can't just be that. You've got to go further. You've got to have a written code of conduct which every single person who walks into that club is given and required to sign, unless they're under the age of 18 or whatever the appropriate age for your country is, in which case a guardian needs to sign that their little spawn will comply with the rules. The idea behind having a code of conduct is it simply puts everyone on the same page. Your code of conduct could include things like don't argue with the GM during the game, argue with the GM after the game. Make sure that you don't bring drinks or food into the venue if the venue is selling food and drinks. And don't tolerate those who sneak in a little here and there. The venue has to make money somehow, and if they didn't make their money, well, you wouldn't have a place for your club in the first place. So don't try and buck the system. Other things to include in your code of conduct could be what type of games you're playing, the age restriction of those games. This club is only available to 18 year olds with blonde hair and green eyes. Your code of conduct is yours. You can include what you like in it. 
I would suggest that you have several policies on what to do if someone is phobic or is racist or is prejudiced against a certain group. You're going to need to have rules for that. I know it's awfully, awfully dull, but it is stuff that is of value. If you don't know or if you're unsure, check with the local venue. I'm sure they're going to have all kinds of rules which you can incorporate so you can focus more on the role-playing side of things. Player contracts, agreeing on certain subjects to include or exclude are also good things to include in your code of conduct. Number five. Now, this is something that a lot of folks, they get confused on. And I'll tell you why. It's hot in the studio today, by the way. Number five, we are talking about your mission statement. And mission statements are always sort of vague, hand-wavy kind of things. But to put them into context, the mission statement for your club could be something along the lines of, we want to create a club whereby people of every background can get together and play role-playing games in a friendly environment. That could be the mission statement. You could push it further to say, we also hope to create a volunteer team who will go out and help the local community on different days. Or perhaps it could be we hope to educate people who have language disabilities or who have English or whatever language your club is in as a second language. It's similar to your code of conduct, but it's more along the lines of the aim of the club, not just the rules. Number six is where things start to get very administrative, but unfortunately unfortunately required. And you can hand this over to the GMs who are running the games at their tables. You need to keep track of attendance. If folks are going to skip out every third, fourth or fifth game or a series of games for no reason whatsoever or are consistently late or disruptive, well that needs to be logged and tracked. And ultimately you as the club owner will eventually have to simply tell that individual that they are no longer welcome. It's not something that anyone is ever happy to do, I don't think but it has to be done because you are running your club and you want your club to be successful. And if you have these disruptive individuals who break campaigns because they don't show up or they show up late, that is unfortunate. Now, this all should be in your code of conduct, by the way. Minimum attendance requirements, minimum late times and that sort of thing. So there is that. But someone does have to keep track of it. And that means the GMs will send you their reports going, well, so-and-so didn't show up again. You have to write it down so you have a record. So often number seven gets ignored and it makes me sad. It makes me sad. I get so sad. I just want to cry. Well, not really. I mean, I'm not going to get that sad. I'm not that emotional. But I, I do get teary-eyed, especially when it's so hot in the studio. Number, number, what the hell am I talking about? Oh, yes, the sadness. The sadness. The great sadness. Roles and responsibilities. You have to delegate the responsibilities of the club to people. This might mean delegating cleanup. Someone has to put the tables and chairs away. Someone has to wash the coffee mugs. Someone has to make sure there's coffee and cream or milk that's been brought in for the players. If that's part of the club's mandate, if that's part of the code of conduct, they will supply. Someone has to look after the attendance registers. Someone has to make sure that new players are looking through the code of conduct and signing it. Don't try and bear this burden. You're uh, 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 mm, a... Ha don't try and bear this burden on your own. This is what makes me sad, is when I see people with huge amounts of enthusiasm and they're gonna go and do it, and they're, yeah, we got a club, and we got a brand, and we got a this, and we got a that, and they got a next thing. And then it all comes crashing down because they are the one doing everything and they get pulled in 12 different directions and then they burn out. Delegate to others if you can, and if you can't find people to do it. That's part of being a club, is supporting each other. Make sure you get the right support to make sure that you can continue to run your club into the future. Don't make me cry. I hate crying. Number eight. Number eight. Number eight. Number eight is very straightforward. Fees. Fees. The venue is very seldom free. Buying milk and coffee and tea and sodas and all that kind of stuff is not free. Uh, buying minis, buying books, buying battle maps is not free. Uh, replacing tablecloths that have had drinks spilled upon them is not free. So you need to work out what are your club fees. How are they structured? Who is looking after it? Who is the bursa? And also... Who gets to decide what the money gets spent on? So if you're charging $5 a night, or whatever the fee might be, after a time, you might have accumulated a fair amount of money. What should happen with that? 
a party at Christmas. Perhaps it should be some kind of um, purchase of a new mini, or some terrain, or some collective dice, or something along those lines. Again, put that into your code of conduct so that everyone knows exactly what is coming up and where the money is going, and then make sure to do it. Spend it wisely, and for heaven's sakes, don't take it home and spend it on upgrading your garden hedge trimmer. Don't do that. Okay. Number nine is something that I like to do, but a lot of players don't like to do it because it takes them out of their comfort zone. Again, if this is part of your code of conduct or your mission statement to introduce folks to people they wouldn't normally have met before, then number nine is for you. Number nine is where you say, right folks, every three weeks or for three weeks of the month, you are playing in your campaign. For one week of the month, it's random shuffle and volunteer GMs or new GMs or whatever will get assigned random people from the pool of the club members. The reason why you do this is because, generally speaking, once you've found your group and you've started to integrate with your group, you're going to stick with that group, even if you are part of a club. Socializing within the club is really important. Why? Well, because if that role-playing group are sitting together and they're having fun and they're chatting and they're carrying on, one of them might go, hey, why are we spending $5 to come and play here when we could go to my place and play for free? Which is a lie because someone's going to be buying drinks and things, so that cost is actually not free, it's just hidden, and suddenly your entire club has lost an entire table of gamers. Whereby if you're swapping them around, not only is there the gigantic benefit of meeting new people and experiencing new styles of GMing and different role-playing games and all that kind of cool and wonderful and fun stuff, but it helps to build harmony within the club. So it's not just a bunch of groups getting together, it's a bunch of people coming together and having fun. But you have to make sure it is in your um, code of conduct so that people don't suddenly go, oh, I, I didn't know that that was coming up. And also be sensitive to folk who may have anxiety about playing new things with new tables. Just be sensitive to those kinds of needs. Number 10, number 10, number 10, number 10. I have left it for last because it is uh, sometimes tricky and that is advertising. If you want to grow your club, you're just going to have to advertise. Now, I was actually sitting with my colleagues the other day and we were saying, oh, we should, um, we should try and start a club. And you go, okay, all right, fine. Is there such a thing as a local radio station and would anyone actually listen to it? We generally decided that no, no one would listen to the local radio station of uh, Bromley suburb. And so we sort of went, well, radio is not really for us then. You need to figure out an advertising strategy. It could be finding local role-playing stores and putting up a notice if they'll let you. It could also be going to the local newspaper or to the local radio if you feel that your age group for your, your club are going to look at those sort of things. Otherwise, it's about asking stores if you can put up posters and windows and that sort of thing. There is a bit of work involved in advertising your club. You're just going to have to knuckle down and get on with it. Don't be disheartened if for the first few weeks nothing happens and no one seems to respond. It takes time for people to rearrange their diaries and most of the time to pluck up the courage to come along. You could even think about having newbie night, which is a special once a month night for people who have no idea but are slightly interested and want a free cookie. Don't offer to give away free cookies, otherwise you'll have a thousand people and no role players in that bunch. Those are my thoughts on how to create a club. If you like the ideas that I presented to you, hit that like button. If you didn't, don't. It's an honest system. Keep it simple. And if you have any other suggestions, if you are a club owner or if you're a venue and you are looking for people to host clubs, that's what the comments are for. Let's build this community. Let's talk about, hey, uh, this is my experience with clubbing. Or not with clubbing, with club running. This is my experience. This is, my, this is what I learned. This is what I learned. This is an opportunity for us to come together as a community and help each other to build even more communities. Oh, and just as a caveat, if you are actually running a role-playing club and you may want some support from a certain GM, feel free to drop me an email at guy at greatgamemaster.com and let's see what we can do for you and your club. Until next week, a massive thank you to our amazing patrons. I do love you all, and I will get there. I swear it. I swear it. They've all been so very kind. They really have. Anyway, huge love to my patrons, and of course, to the usual team that brings you all of this wonderful stuff, the Web Goblin and the Editing Goblin. And until next time, happy gaming!